Alrighty, good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone. I am very glad to see you all here. Um, it is a pleasure to be here, and uh, this is a very, very awesome study, or not a uh, very, very awesome day we've got planned here. Uh, fantastic time. It's going to be really, really good. So uh, I'm really looking forward to what we have in store today. Um, this is, uh, you know, we're going to start off here with sacred history. This is our time where we're looking at a, none other than uh, a man by the name of Nicholas Culpepper. Nicholas Culpepper was a fantastic individual. Very, very interesting. Very, very different to what you would think of an individual uh, in his day. My goodness, was he a firebrand. I mean, some of the things that he said were, whew. <laughs> um, his life was very short, but just, uh, just his impact is still felt today in both modern Western medicine and also in, in Western herbalism. Uh, it's, I mean, his, his influence is immense. Absolutely, phenomenally immense. Just an incredible, incredible man. Um, not all of what he said was accurate. Um, not all of what he said was helpful. Uh, but a lot of uh, but it's not so much the specifics of what he said so much as what he did that really brought things, uh, and, uh, that really was his main purpose and influence. Uh, so it's really, really important for us to remember that. Uh, it's really important for us to remember that. Um, so that being said, we're going to go ahead and uh, open up with a word of prayer like always and... Um, uh, and, yeah, so let's open up with a word of prayer, and we'll dive right on into it. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your grace, for your mercy, for your love, for your wisdom, and for the Sabbath. Thank you so much, Lord, that we can uh, begin by looking at the life of a man who I believe you used uh, to bring people out of a time of great darkness. Uh, Lord, you care as much about our health as you do about... Um, as you do about our spiritual condition. And so I just ask that you would please be with us now. Help us to understand this, that you would help us to learn the incredible, important things that are out there. Thank you so much again for everything that you do. And Lord, I ask that you would please bring people who need to hear this. Thank you so much once again. In Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Alrighty, thank you once again, everyone, for joining us. I am the King's Bard. You can find me on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, and if you have any questions or anything or comments or anything like that at any point, please feel free to uh, to do that. I uh, I make you know I do talk a lot, but uh, yes, uh, you're more than welcome to uh, ask questions, make comments. Uh, all sorts of things like that in chat, and I do respond to chat. Um, I might be looking elsewhere for a moment, but I will be responding. So uh, chat is always welcome. A lot of my information today is coming, once again, from this book, Green Pharmacy by Barbara Griggs. Uh, big, huge shout-out to this. If you don't have this book, get it. Um, it is a fantastic, fantastic, fantastic book. It doesn't talk about cold pepper as much as I would like, but I'm going to supplement that from knowledge el uh, gleaned from elsewhere. Um, but that being said, we are going to go ahead and dive right on in. Uh, so, Nicholas Culpepper. Who was he? Why was he so important? When did he live? Well, most people who have heard of the name Nicholas Culpepper are people who are already well versed in uh, the history of uh, the history of medicine or in herbalism, because even today the herbals of Nicholas Culpepper are still the most successful and most. I mean, my goodness, you can still find Culpepper's herbals today. And even though a lot of his stuff is fishy and you know, kind of you know. Eh. <laughs> not not quite right. He did have astrology as one of his main things that he that he advocated. At the same time, uh, his his herbals and his uh, his information that he have had and that he gave to the people uh, was some of the most. I mean, it's still influential today. It's still used today. Um, in fact, you can go on and buy Culpepper's herbals 
uh, for you know on online. You can buy them. Yeah, I mean these books that were published in the 17th century in the 1600s. Right, these books were. How can I say it? Um, <laughs> Uh, they were incredibly influential, so much so that, well, they pretty much started the whole trend of herbals, um, which I'll get into that in a minute. Right. But to give you some background, Nicholas Culpepper lived in a day and an age when medicine was in conflict. Um, you had a real, real huge conflict in medicine at this time. Nicholas Culpepper was born in 1616, and if I can get the specific date for you, 18th of October, 1616, in England. Uh, he was a, uh, a very, very interesting man. Um, his parents were, uh, let's see here, uh, he was also, uh, he, he was the son of a cleric. Um, his father died shortly after he was born, and uh, he himself uh, was actually named after his father. Uh, Nicholas Culpepper Jr. would be the one that we're talking about. Nicholas Culpepper Sr. was his father who died shortly after he was born. Um, he, how can I say this? Um, he was educated at Cambridge University. He had a very, very expensive, or uh, yeah, it was very, very, uh, not expensive, but a very, very extensive, that's what I meant to say, not expensive, an extensive education at Cambridge where he became an apothecary, um, and would have possibly uh, become a doctor, except for one thing. He, uh, <laughs> he fell in love. That's at least according to Barbara Griggs here. Uh, uh, he planned a runaway marriage with this, uh, with this girl, and uh, on the way, uh, on the way to the wedding, she was struck by lightning and killed. Um, so that's quite the quite the tragic story for him here. Uh, just a re an incredible uh, just, wow! Uh, just just out of nowhere, she was killed, and uh, Culpepper, of course, Nicholas was completely shattered. This is something that really broke him. He abandoned his studies at Cambridge, and. Um, he basically became an apothecary. Now, one might think that this was a, a terrible thing. I mean, and it was to him, to be fair. He was a, uh, how shall I say it? He, you know, this was this was an awful thing. You know, he lost someone who he loved dearly, and you know, it's unfor it's it's horrible. But at the same time, it was this that really kickstarted his. How shall I say it? It really this was what put him into the circumstances by which he would best be able to be used. Much like Martin Luther, who in his day, a century before, had originally been going to expensive university to become a doctor in philo to develop, uh, to obtain a doctorate in philosophy, a PhD, uh, and, uh, and a doctor of law, I believe it was that he was wanting to be. And uh, then suddenly, uh, being extremely convicted of his sins, ran off and joined a convent. So, too, was Nicholas Culpepper, a man who originally wanted to be a doctor of medicine and ultimately fell away from it and became an apothecary instead. Now, what is the difference, one might ask, between an apothecary and a doctor in the 17th century, in the 1600s? Well, <laughs> there was a lot, actually, and yet there was also not a lot. Uh, the uh, Unlike the doctors, uh, well, the doctors, they tended to study lots and lots and lots of theory. This was what uh, Culpepper would have been studying for his many years at Cambridge. Uh, he, uh, he studied much theory on medicine, Galenical theory in particular. This was something that, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've referred to in previous videos where we've talked about this. Um, Galen was pretty much the, uh, the, uh, the Roman Dr. Galen, his theories were pretty much the foundation of all of Western medicine for, well, almost a thousand years, um, actually over a thousand years. And um, 
it was this Galenic theory that Culpepper would have been studying in Cambridge, and that's what the doctors really founded themselves on. Uh, they relied on uh, theory rather than practical things uh, to determine what was appropriate for a disease. So they didn't say, you know, oh, well, you know, this works, so we're going to give it this. No, it was, okay, well, this disease has these characteristics, and this herb has these characteristics, so this herb should work for this disease. Sometimes it did, sometimes it didn't. Um, the apothecaries were a little bit different. They didn't rely as much on Galen, um, and they weren't as formally educated. They were more natural, and I say more natural, or more practical, I wouldn't say natural, more, more practical than the, uh, than the doctors of the day. Uh, these, uh, the apothecaries were people who, they, they tended to rely or, on making huge amounts of money from people by making extensively complicated, uh, ridiculously complicated, uh, compounds for medicine. Uh, the doctors made their money with consultations, the apothecaries made their money by you know, making ridiculously complicated medications. Um, and this was something that uh, was very, very common. This was, I mean, that's what you did when you were an apothecary. You would often have 50 or 60 ingredients in one medicine, um, which, of course, is complete nonsense, right? Even today, you know, in, in our, uh, with all the problems that our pharmaceutical industry has, because uh, it does have problems, um, at the same time, you know, even they recognize that you don't want to put 50 different drugs in one pill, right? And the problem is that that's what they were doing. The apothecaries in those days were doing that. They were formulating these ridiculously, you know, extensively complicated uh, medications. And uh, this is what Culpepper really wanted to do. While he was a, um, while he was apprenticing, he actually came under the influence of a, uh, a man by the name of John Goodwin. Uh, he was a preacher uh, at the time, and uh, how can I say this? Um, he was extremely radical. Uh, John Goodwin was a preacher who basically said, no authority is above questioning. This is the same time period, right? That j this is the time period right before uh, you have the American Revolution, right before you have the, um, oh, what else? Yeah, right before the American Revolution, right before the French Revolution, right before, uh, and, and around the time of the English Civil War, right, where you had the parliamentarians versus the royalists, um, you know, the, the people who followed the monarchy versus the people who were uh, going after, uh, who were following Parliament. Uh, so you really had republic democ the republicanism, the republic idea, rep rep republicanism and monarchy. These were the two big things that were be that were in conflict right now, uh, and ultimately it would then lead to uh, such events as the American Revolution and the French Revolution and so on. Although the French Revolution was of a different nature, but it tried to be what the American Revolution was. Right? Uh, you all, this was also around the time period of the Glorious Revolution, and pretty much right smack in the middle of the Eighty Years' War in the Netherlands uh, versus in, and the Netherlands versus Spain. So you have this really, really big conflict, all these different conflicts going on. This is a really, really complicated and, uh, how shall I say, uh, convoluted uh, and uh, time in Earth's history. And, well, Culpepper was thrust in right in the middle of this. Um, and it's very, very interesting that, this, uh, that he would actually come into play at this time. Because he was, as I mentioned earlier, about a hundred years after the time of Martin Luther, who really kicked started the whole thing in the first place, saying, "Well, hold on a minute, Church, you don't have control control over the consciences of the people. You can't tell the people how they want to worship. You can't do that." And um, and while he ultimately did. Well, he didn't, but his followers really started to uh, use the power of the state to control people's consciences. Uh, he was part of the magisterial reformers, not the radical reformers like the Anabaptists or the um, the Huguenots or the Waldenses. Uh, you had, uh, or Albigenses, uh, those were radical reformers, people who believed in particular, well, in particular, the Anabaptists. Um, they believed that the, the state cannot tell anybody at all what the church is. You have to have separation between church and state. This, that was where the idea of separation of church and state first, of church and state first came from, was the Anabaptists. Uh, 
and well, at least in, in modern times, relatively modern times, um, post medieval era. And uh, Culpepper being around a hundred years after that, he was, you know, the world was still kind of reeling from Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation. Uh, and medicine itself was already reeling too, because around the same time as the Protestant Reformation, you had a man by the name of Paracelsus, who we've talked about before, who really threw a wrench in the works of medicine and said, no, 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 Galen? Yeah, get rid of that dude. You don't, he doesn't work. Um, but they also did do things like use mineral medicines, which had never been used before, especially uh, mercury was used um, not as much. You know, it was it was used more um, and extracts and other things like that were more often used. Um, they and, and when I say extracts, I mean extracts, you know, not just like an alcohol extract, like like a tincture. Tinctures were used for, for as long as. It's something that's been around for ages and ages and ages. Pretty much since alcohol, uh, there's been a, yeah, pretty much since alcohol and sickness came, there were tinctures, alcohol extracts. This is not an alcohol extract I'm talking about. This is where you boil something down and you put a bunch of chemicals in there and you create salts and other things like that. It's, you know, it's chemistry, right? That's who these people were. They were chemists. Alchemists, but chemists. Um, and... So medicine was reeling from this, and into the fray now comes a young Nicholas Culpepper. Uh, he, some of the things that he said, oh man, I, I gotta share some of those with you. But Culpepper, coming under the uh, influence of uh, John Goodwin, this radical preacher who said, hey, you can question everybody. Doesn't matter who they are. Doesn't matter if they're a doctor. Doesn't matter if they're uh, the king. It doesn't matter who they are. Doesn't matter if it's the Pope. You can question everybody. No authority is, is unquestionable authority. You can question them. You can challenge them. You can say, hey, are you sure? You know, you can't, you don't have to take their word as, you know, divine order or divine law. Um, and this was something that Culpepper really, really embraced. Uh, uh, throughout his life, um, he <clears throat> ultimately became the neighborhood doctor to a number of people, or at least basically, that's what he would, basic, and a lot of apothecaries were that way. Uh, but one thing that Culpepper did that uh, not a lot of apothecaries did was he tried to make medicine cheap. So when he, when people would come to him, He would try, uh, most apothecaries, when they had patients come to them, they would try and upsell because they were businessmen as well. You know, they were trying to make a living, right? And so their thought was, well, I need to make a living, so I need to upsell this, right? So they tried to sell their patients the most expensive medications you could possibly get the, per the patient to buy. Um, and these, again, were extremely complicated and extremely, you know, out there. Uh, some really, let me see if I can find some of these remedies. Uh, these were, let's see here. Uh, no. No. Um, I'm going to, uh, I can't find anything at the moment, but, uh, well, uh, no, the, uh, the apothecaries. Here we go. Uh, you had, of course, the oil of swallows, right? This this was, let's see if I can find the recipe. Oil of swallows. Eh, basically, it was a, uh, yeah, the oil of swallows was very, very nasty. Oh, these are some really, like, there's some really, strange things, uh, including animal excrement, human excrement, um, mashed up millipedes, uh, lots of nasty things that were in there, toads and frogs and uh, swallows, you know, fish and, and all sorts of things, you know, witches brews, basically, you know, what we think of as witches brews anyway. Um, Culpepper didn't do this. When Nicholas Culpepper had a patient come to him, he would then say, okay, Let's go to the back garden, 
All right, let's go to the backyard. All right, see that plant there? You know what it looks like, okay. I've got it stocked up here, so you don't, you know, already prepared. Let me give it to you. Let me give the preparation to you, and let me teach you how to prepare it. That's what Culpepper did. So he, and it's, it's, <laughs> he said uh, that he would use to, he used to prescribe cheap but wholesome medicines, not sending them to the East Indies for drugs, when they may fetch better out of their own gardens. Um, <laughs> he. He had a particular, how shall I say it? He had a particular affinity for poor patients. Um, he really, really had a uh, very strong concern for those uh, who could not afford medications uh, or most medications. And so, and, and on top of that, he had the idea that, well, why use something extremely expensive when you can just go to your backyard, right? This was Nicholas Culpepper. This was a man who was supposed to be right an apothecary and making all this money by selling expensive things. He didn't do that. This that just wasn't who he was. Um, and he, uh, in fact, he was so concerned with his patients, right, that he would often flat out refuse to be paid. That's how concerned he was for people who were poor. He would just say, no, I'm not going to let you pay me. <laughs> you are not going to pay me. I am going to do this for you for free. Um, just an incredibly, incredibly generous man. Um, and on top of that, he got he became so popular, he would often see 40 patients in a single morning. That's not a day. <laughs> 40 patients in a morning. He was so busy. People really, really, really wanted to see him. This was unprecedented. Nobody had ever really done this before. Not even uh, Paracelsus, who had been around, you know, who had, a century before, had really advocated many of the same basic ideas, at least kind of started, kick-started the whole thing with the idea of, oh, hey, you know, let's just use, you know, let's just use what works, right? Let's not use the theory of, of Galen, because that doesn't really work. Let's just see what works. If it works, we use it. If it doesn't work, we don't use it, right? The, the very empirical uh, mindset that Paracelsus had. And again, there were a lot of errors with Paracelsus, but that's okay. He was coming out of a long period of darkness. Um, and, you know, what else are you going to do, right? And on top of that, you have now Culpepper building. Now, again, Culpepper had some funky things that he wrote about. Um, and we'll get to that in a minute. But his big contribution was this. Medicine for the people. This was something that really, really, really became the it, this was his life work um he he wrote let's see if i can find how many or er, how many herbals he wrote um hmm. i can't find let, well you know what let me see Ah, okay. Okay, so uh, basically, Culpepper began to write down the things that he need that he wanted. He uh, he would actually start to translate. Uh, one thing that actually really bugged him, and this is something that uh, is really interesting. Culpepper really had a very very strong uh, dislike for people who used complicated names or exotic names for things, or more particularly Latin names. Uh, and Latin terms for medications and things like that, um, but also for people who used things in general to keep things from the people. Um, he said, in fact, that there are three people, uh, he said, this is what he said here, three kinds of people mainly disease the people, priests, physicians, and lawyers. Priests disease matters belonging to the soul, physicians disease matters belonging to the body, and lawyers disease matters belonging to the estate. Um, referring to the fact that these people would use Latin and keep things from the people. Uh, now, uh, once again, Culpepper was a very interesting and a very radical individual. He was a very, very strong Republican. And when I say Republican, I don't mean the American term Republican. Um, the, the, the word Republican has taken on different meanings throughout history. Um, 
When I say Republican here, this is someone in England at this time who was for basically for abolishing the monarchy and establishing a democratic republic, um, or at least some kind of republic. Uh, basically abolishing the monarchy altogether and just having parliament. That's what, you know, and, and which is, you know, a democratic republic. This is something that didn't happen, but that's what his political beliefs were. He was a Republican. Um, and, you know, once again, not the same thing as an American Republican. This is, in fact, this is about 100, uh, it's more than like 150 years before America was even, you know, before America even thought of independence. Um, you know, this is, it's a long time before then. So, um, it's a say it's a, nearly two centuries before so uh, it's it's quite a while back so it doesn't mean the same thing but he was a Republican he had this mindset that oh I, you know it's all about the people need to have control the people need to have the power the people need to you know the power the authority the ability education all of that needs to reside with the people not with people in power this was his viewpoint, and he took this, yes, in politics, but he also took it and put it into practice in his medicine. Um, he wouldn't use, uh, he actually went and he took the pharmacopoeia, which was the, uh, the London pharmacopoeia, which was the, basically the list of drugs and, and other, uh, and medications, list of herbs and other medications that would be used by your average everyday physician. Uh, and it was all in Latin, because Latin was the language of the scholars in those days. And Culpepper went, and because of his education in Cambridge, he, well, translated it into English. This was something that hadn't been done before. Just like with the Bible that had only been recently translated into modern English, uh, under King James the First of Scot uh, King James First of England, Sixth of Scotland, which was basically just entirely copied from William Tyndale, who'd done it something like sixty years, fifty or sixty years before that. But uh, and uh, so there was a lot of translating going on at this time uh, in sixteen forty nine. He translated the, uh, this pharmacopoeia from Latin into English, and he uh, titled it the Physical Directory. Uh, and he did this not only for the benefit of the people, but also for the benefit of his fellow apothecaries, who most of them didn't know Latin or knew very little Latin. Um, like me, I can read a few Latin terms, but do I know, you know, can I just straight read Latin and translate it? No. <laughs> You know, I can't. It, it, I can't do that. But, you know, can I understand, for example, Latin binomials? You know, like Latin names? Yeah, I can understand that. I can understand Latin terms for, um, oh, what should I call it? Uh, for homeopathic medications. But that doesn't mean that I can read Latin. It just means that I can understand a few terms. And uh, Culpepper knew that that was very much the same way that most people were in those days. Most apothecaries were, anyway. Very few of them knew Latin well, and those that knew Latin at all knew it pretty shakily or just a little bit. Um, and most of them didn't even know that. So uh, Latin was something that he very much uh, translated. Uh, you know, so, or Latin was something he very much despised, keeping things from the people. Um, however, <laughs> He, uh, he began to experience some opposition, uh, and this was, there was a number of reasons for this. Uh, but no, first and foremost, he got criticism from, at first, the, the College of Physicians, which didn't like the idea that this random apothecary, you know, medical school dropout was schooling them on how to, <laughs> how to take care of the sick. And, um... He, they, they had, I mean, just translating the pharmacopoeia was enough, as, uh, as Barbara Griggs puts it, uh, just translating it alone to English was enough to give uh, the college apoplexy, which is a stroke, you know. <laughs> so basically, like, look, they would have had a stroke if they just, you know, just with the translation alone, but he didn't just stop at translating it, right? He, <laughs> he took 
everyone to task. Basically, in his translation, right, he he just absolutely unleashes this absolute scorn for the people who were keeping this information from the public. Uh, <laughs> he said, um, he, he called the doctors proud, insulting, and domineering, whose wits were born above 500 years before themselves. <laughs> so in other words, you know, like, look, they're 500 years behind schedule. Um, and he, he also said, send for them to a poor man's house who is not able to give them their fee, then they will not come, and the poor creature for whom Christ died must forfeit his life for want of money. In other words, he says, look, guys, you're gonna, you're so expensive that you would not go to a poor man's house who needs your medicine just because they can't pay you, and the poor man has to die, this poor individual has to die because he didn't have enough money. Now, I wonder where we've heard something like that before. <laughs> this is something that is a huge problem today. In fact, it's the major cause of, of complaint for virtually everybody across the world, at least in, in well, about America in particular. But America, the thing is, right, and this is something that a lot of people don't understand. A lot of people in other countries don't understand this. So if you're from a country other than America, especially Western country other than America, where your government pays the medical bills for you, or at least lessens it, right? I've got some news for you. Medicine doesn't cost. Now, medicine isn't cheap. At least modern medicine isn't cheap. Sure, it may not cost as much as you are paying for it, um, or as much as we're paying for it, rather, but it certainly costs more than what you're paying for it. Uh, the average cost of producing a drug in 2019 was $2.4 billion, or so, I believe. Um, and it did go down in 2020 um, to something like $1.3 billion, but that's the cheapest it's been in ages. And so it's expensive to produce any new medications, especially drug medications. Uh, and the reason that we pay so much is because all y'all aren't paying what should be paid um, to kind of balance it out. So we have to take the brunt of it. Um, that being said, not all medical procedures are that way. For example, you know, it doesn't take $150 to put your arm in a sling, right? Maybe for the x-rays, but, you know. But nevertheless, there is a huge problem with medicine, modern medicine. It costs so much. It's so insanely expensive, and that is exactly what Culpepper was talking about. And I find it very interesting that the solution that we have today, right, is, okay, we'll let the government pay for it. But that's going to put the government into debt. And our government's already in debt pretty severely. Um, in fact, most nations are. That's a problem. On top of that, like, is the government really going to bear all the costs of the development of all those drugs? $1.3 billion a drug? <laughs> um. Well, like, okay. All right, then. That's expensive, you know? And, and if things go back up to the way they were before, $2.4 billion a drug? That's expensive. The solution that's really interesting to me is I actually side with Culpepper here. Nicholas Culpepper really had it right. You shouldn't have medicine be this extremely expensive thing that is for a few people to learn. Now, I want to quantify, I want to qualify this. There are things that still should belong to the field of the medical, of, to the medical field exclusively, to medical professionals. I think that we should leave certain things like, you know, complicated medical procedures, medical exception, you know, medical exceptional medical cases um, or rare medical cases uh, or extremely complicated ones and cancers and things like that. Those should be, you know, very, very life threatening ones that require a lot of skill. Yeah, those should and diagnosis and things like that. That's OK to to leave on the hands 
of the physicians. But I think we need a new type of medical professional. And we need something like Culpepper. People who, who instead of going out and uh, instead of charging these exorbitant amounts of money and relying upon pharmaceutical companies for their income, instead they should go to uh, they they, sh they should rely on simple herbs and simple remedies uh, that go you know that don't cost a whole lot of money and they can still diagnose they can still treat they have the ability to diagnose they have the ability to treat but they go out uh, but when when a case comes to them that they don't know or that they're not spread able to really deal with they should send it to western medicine uh, to modern medicine uh, be, you know I think that things could really work that way but the problem is that we ha you know it it doesn't Right now, we don't have that structure, and that would solve so many problems. I mean, again, Nicholas Culpepper, this man, right, would see 40 patients a morning. He was so popular. This man would, I mean, and, and the reason he was so popular is because he was so cheap. His medicine, and this was in the 1600s. These people were going out, right, and they had these things, they had these situation you know they had these problems right these common ailments and he wouldn't use expensive herbs because that's what they had in those days he wouldn't use expensive herbs he wouldn't use expensive uh preparations or complicated preparations no he would go out to the backyard and or you know the forest or wherever he was he would go out there and he would pick what he needed and it's free to him so oftentimes he would charge minimally or nothing um, and of course, you know, that's charity, you know, on his behalf. Now, uh, Culpepper, to kind of bring things back on topic, ultimately Culpepper really began to say, hey, you know what, I want people to really have access here to these, um, uh, to, to medicine. Uh, and, you know, he said, hey, you know what, I don't particularly like the way the medical establishment is working. I don't particularly like the way even my own apothecary, you know, fellows are, are working. So I'm going to take things into my own hands. And um, <laughs> he, he ultimately said, okay, I am going to put this in the hands of the people. And he published in 1852, or no, not 18, 1652, I think it was. Yes, 1652. He went out, right, and he published his herbal. It wasn't called an herbal at the time, but uh, he published his herbal, and then in 1653 he republished it and named it as an herbal. And in that one book that he published in 1653, he had over 400 herbs categorized, named, English names and Latin names, and in simple English, in the plain language of the people, he per he listed the benefits of the herb, how they could be used, how they wouldn't be used, when you, when to harvest them, where to find them, and everything else like that. And pretty much every herbal since that day has had all that information in it. Nicholas Culpepper's herbals you can still buy today online, uh, and you can you can still find them. They're plate, you know. There's I think they're still one of the most published herbals of all time, right? And it was because of Culpepper even that modern medicine started doing, the th you know, started listing pharmaco uh, pharmaceuticals the way it did. It was because of Culpepper that this, this all happened. Now, I have said before uh, that Culpepper had some issues, and one of the major things was his astrology. Um, he had herbs linked very, very heavily to astrology, and that's quite unfortunate. Uh, but at the same time, it, you know, again, coming out of a time of great darkness. This was a time period up to that point where medicine had really been overshadowed. And Culpepper was really trying to look for something new. He'd become interested in astrology and time and all that stuff as a boy. Um, and things just kind of kept going from there. Um, and it's, it's very, very unfortunate that he did. But uh, that doesn't negate the fact that even though he practiced, or that he practiced astrology and that he listed astrology in all his books, his herbals are still massively, massively important. Just like Martin Luther or John Calvin or some of these other uh, people who really pushed for the Protestant Reformation, who really pushed for these things, uh, 
they had errors in their doctrines too. They had mistakes that were made, and you know they had these things that you know they weren't all that. You know, some of those things are a little, you know, but at the same time, right? You still had, you know, the basic principles that they were teaching that were true. And the same thing goes with Nicholas Culpepper. Even though he had he made mistakes, he didn't know. Even though he made uh, he had, you know, some things that aren't necessarily the most scientifically accurate. At the same time, his basic principles of getting medicine to the people, of get, of making it available to everybody, this is something that has actually carried on even through American herbalism today. Um, but it was it was something that really, I think, could be beneficial to the medical establishment of today. If we have these things where people can just go out into their backyards, go out into the, into the areas around their home, and, you know, if they're educated enough about these things, you know, that they can use these things on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, again, I think that there should still be medical professionals who are, you know, who are able to diagnose and treat disease and prescribe things, but who aren't allopathic doctors. These people should be able to rely on basic natural remedies for your average, everyday common diseases. When you get to something a little bit more exceptional, more extraordinary, more rare, or more complicated, that's when you should turn to Western medicine. And that's when we should have, you know, that's when they would be be able to say, hey, you know what, let's let's give that to Western medicine. That's what we need. We don't need what we need is not a new. Uh, what we need is not to keep the same thing, the same system. We need a new system. All right. We don't need a new payment system. We need a new system of medicine, or a new structure of the system, without eliminating all the old keep bringing in the new. Um, especially in America, we really need that. But, I digress. Nicholas Culpepper ultimately uh, died uh, very young, and the reason was uh, likely, they were like, well, uh, he got involved in a, um, in a political conflict um, of Republican forces, and he, uh, he became a battlefield surgeon. And while he was on the battlefield one day, he, uh, he was injured very heavily in the chest. Um, and that injury he never fully recovered from. He ultimately died of tuberculosis at the age of 37. Now, um, once again, you know, that, that's probably due largely, at least in my opinion, probably largely due to his chest injury. It weakened him and exposed him to that. And so... You know, on top of that, tuberculosis was already the number one cause of disease in that time anyway. So, um, well, num number one cause of death, not number one cause of disease. <laughs> number one cause of death uh, in, for ages and ages was tuberculosis. And so he died quite young, but at the same time, he, his work and his influence still exists to this day. Um, and it's incredible, the things that you can find, the information that he had um, in those days, you can still find it today. I actually am thinking about buying a copy of his herbal just so that I can have reference to those things. Um, not necessarily to the astrology that's part of it, but because of the uh, just the absolutely incredible and significant uh, contributions that he made to medicine, both West, both modern medicine and uh, natural medicine. So that being said, um, now is the time for uh, questions and comments uh, exclusively. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the chat now. Uh, I will see them and I'll comment them. I'll keep talking while I'm waiting for them, uh, waiting for the chat to be, um, uh, waiting for y'all to type. Um, so, uh, anyway, uh, if you want to know more about herbalism and about other things, if you want to know more about the basic principles of herbalism or natural living, um, then uh, awesome. Uh, hi there, Swiss R. Good to see you, uh, and thank you for being here. It's a real pleasure. Um, the uh, If you want to know more about those things, you can find me on YouTube and on Facebook. I do have a playlist on natural living. Uh, so please do check that out. I've got a whole uh, thing on basic principles of healthy living, uh, the RESTORED acronym. We finished that not too long ago. Uh, so do check that out. I've also got stuff on herbalism. 
uh, natural remedies, and uh, just some fantastic stuff. Um, and I am really, really excited to let you all know that I am indeed actually learning to uh, in school at the moment to become a licensed uh, herbalist, uh, a licensed medical herbalist uh, in Ireland. So uh, it's absolutely fantastic. I'm really look. I'm I'm uh, I'm really enjoying the program, and I'm hoping that I can bring some principles here to the United States wh while I'm here, as well as when I'm over in Europe. Uh, that's absolutely fantastic. So anyway, um, it doesn't look like there are any more questions or comments. Uh, or any any more comments or any questions at this time. Once again, if you want to know more, you can always contact me at the King's Bard on Facebook or on YouTube. Uh, and of course, you can always check out more stuff. If you've been here watching the recorded video, uh, greetings to you. Very glad to see you. Uh, and uh, like uh, hit that uh, hit that like button if you're, whether on Facebook or YouTube. Hit the like button. If you're on Twitch, uh, then uh, hit that follow. And uh, also hit that subscribe button on YouTube, the notification bell, and like the page as well if you haven't already uh, on Facebook. Anyway, that being said, we're going to go ahead and close out with a word of prayer. And we will go ahead and prepare for our Bible study today at 1115. So please do join us for that. Uh, it's a really fantastic study. I hope to see you there. Uh, so let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your grace, for your mercy, for your love, and for your kindness. Thank you so much for everything that you are and uh, that you don't just care about our spiritual health, but that our physical health is also important to you and that you have led individuals through history uh, to uh, a greater understanding of the healing principles that you would have us advocate. The Lord, I ask that you would please be with us now and prepare our hearts for studying your word, that you would keep us and prepare us, and above all else, that Jesus would be lifted up and glorified. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray and ask all these things. Amen. Alrighty, thank you once again, everybody. Uh, I will see you guys at 1115.